So we come to the third of our video clips. This is where, in a sense, the rubber really hits the road, just to the extent that you accept the foundational case in the first three maps. What I'm about to show you now starts to take that further. I've omitted in this video presentation maps four, five, and six. You have access to those. By all means, study them and feel free to ask questions about them later. But in these video clips, I'm just trying to cover the absolute fundamentals of the case. In this next map, which is actually map seven from the report, we're looking at the argument that Roger Hollis fits better than any other candidate, both the description of Ellie by Igor Gazenko in 1945 and the recorded anomalies in MI5's coverage of Soviet espionage or its counter-espionage effort in the 1940s and crucially not only in the period up to 1945 but in the years up to 1950. So if in fact Roger Hollis was not Ellie, if Ellie was some other figure, if for argument's sake, though we believe we've dealt this a fatal blow, Ellie was Leo Long, the anomalies in the late 1940s would be very anomalous indeed because we wouldn't have an Ellie that we could pinpoint in those years. And Guzenko had described Ellie as being in place up to 1944 or 45, but no defector after that date pointed to Ellie or the GRU mole in MI5. So there is some surmise here, but it's the pattern of reasoning and anomaly we want to get into focus. What I'm going to step through here is not the entire map. You have access to that in front of you. I just want to point to the very top levels, the fundamental architecture of the case, so that your questions can then delve down one node or another and say, here is where I'd like to ask a question. Here is what I'm not clear about. Here is what I'm sceptical about. Let's just do that. So the three component parts, what you can see in this top level map, let's call it once again a kind of Socrates map, a very simple diagram, is that these three parts consist of the claim, first of all, that Roger Hollis more or less uniquely fits the description of Ellie given by Guzenko in 1945. The second component part is that Hollis best fits an explanation of what the agent Ellie was actually doing in terms of anomalies that took place in MI5 between 1940 and 45. The third, 1C, suggests that Hollis is actually by far the best fit for the anomalies in the late 1940s, after the World War. Now, all of this, of course, is before Hollis rose to become first Deputy Director and then Director General of MI5. I haven't, in the report, actually endeavoured to cover that very important but later part of Hollis's career. It would require a more voluminous report. If, however, these fundamentals, the first few maps and this and the next one I'm going to show you, hold up, then it shows beyond Cavill that there is a case to answer. And for that very reason, one would start to look very carefully and thoughtfully at the later part of Hollis's career. Let's take 1A, 1B and 1C to one level further down just to drive home what we're saying here. We'll start with 1A. Note that there are again two supporting arguments here. The first is that Guzenko described in some detail the profile of Ellie and Hollis fits that profile and in important respects he uniquely fits that profile. This is important and should not be lightly dismissed. In fact uh, the underpinnings suggest that this is a very strong clue. So what was the description? Guzenko says, first of all, Ellie is male. Secondly, that he has direct access to MI5's files on matters to do with Russia, with Soviet espionage, and with communists of interest in Britain. That so happens to have been true of Hollis from virtually the start of his career in MI5, and certainly through the Second World War and the late 1940s. And thirdly, he said rather intriguingly that Ellie had something Russian in his background. Now this is, a, this is a teasing thing which for the longest time was given no attention until Roger Hollis's brother, Christopher, published a memoir in which he said that it was a commonly accepted belief within the Hollis family that they were descendants of an Ill illegitimate child of Peter the Great. There's something Russian in the background. 
Now, the only way that can have entered into the picture and come to Kuzenko's attention is if Ellie, and in this case, um, for the sake of argument, Hollis, had been in communication with people in Moscow uh, and in Moscow's network and told them that story at some point. And it had become known that there was this mysterious figure who had this Russian connection. One doesn't need to overplay that to see that here is a building block of the case. If you want to argue that he was somebody other than Hollis, then either you have to reject Guzenko's description as imaginary or misleading, or you have to find a candidate who was male, had that access, and on the face of it, had something Russian in their background. And to the best of my knowledge at this juncture, there is no other candidate who meets that description. The second thing to consider is that Hollis denigrated Guzenko as a defector and as a source uh, and connived in ensuring that there would be no serious investigation within MI5 into Guzenko's claims. No hunt for Ellie. It's significant that at that same time, Moscow Centre fully expected that there would be a very serious mole hunt for Ellie. And they took preemptive steps to protect their assets against such an investigation. But rather to their surprise, there wasn't one. There never really was, at least not until the 1960s, well and truly after the event. And this is exactly what one of we would have expected. That is to say, if Hollis was the mole, one would have expected that he would do his best to fend off an inquiry into Guzenko's allegations. Now, this is an interesting line of inquiry. And let me say just briefly that given the whole pattern of behaviour of MI6 regarding Philby, etc., given the complacency in the British intelligence establishment at that time, it's plausible to argue that Hollis was no different to many of his colleagues and he just didn't take the allegation seriously. It's plausible, but it's not in itself convincing because we know that Philby, who was without any doubt a Soviet mole, did exactly the same thing in trying to defect, deflect defector allegations about moles and such. So that particular part is open to either interpretation and needs to be looked at very closely. Either Hollis was just very complacent when his specific job was counterintelligence or he was in fact a mole defending his turf. Bear that in mind. Let's move to the second part, 1B, but that is to do with the anomalies in the 1940s, the early 1940s. Now this is a complex map. I'm only looking here at the very next level down. Consider first of all that the Kravitsky debrief landed in Moscow very quickly after it was prepared for MI5. And who is it that had specific custody of that report in that period? Roger Hollis. I won't pause now to argue the toss. I simply want to register a series of these anomalies one after another and to lodge in your memories and imaginations that the reason why suspicion keeps coming back to Hollis is because of his presence in one after another of these which has never been satisfactorily explained or dealt with. That was simply the first. The second is that there were warnings subsequent to Kravitsky's that there was a GRU mole in MI5 and these were ignored. And it just so happens that the key person who should have responded, who indeed did respond to those allegations and who ignored those allegations or urged that they be disregarded was Roger Hollis. He was, from the beginning of his career, in the key positions in MI5 dealing with Soviet counter-espionage. The third is that Hollis became, at an early point in his career, the pole position man in MI5 for dealing with nuclear security. And in that capacity, he cleared a number of known communists to work in the nuclear weapons program, most notably Klaus Fuchs, who played a crucial role in supplying nuclear intelligence to the Soviet Union. We'll come back to Klaus Fuchs in connection with the network through which he supplied that information. But note that Roger Hollis personally and specifically and three times cleared Klaus Fuchs and misled the FBI regarding Fuchs's status and his communist background so that he was able to work not only in England but also in the United States on nuclear weapons. The fourth ground, 2G, if we look again at this map, and I simply scroll it across, is that there was a family, the Kuczynski family, 
who operated in Britain in the 1940s for the most part, and prior to that elsewhere on the continent and in China, three at least of whom are known to have been GRU agents, one of whom, very importantly, will come to shortly. They, as a family, were on a watch list for MI5 from the 1920s. They were well known as being communists. They were suspected of working for the GRU. And on his watch, from the beginning of his career in MI5, Roger Hollis consistently kept them off lists of communists or suspects of concern that were sent to the FBI, downplayed their role within Britain, and indeed, as we shall see, actively protected the crucial one among them, Ursula Kosinski. Um, but that's our next map. Finally, a spectacular case of espionage in 1943 was when the Quebec Agreement between Britain and the United States on their nuclear program, which was kept very secret, not even Congress or the British Parliament were informed, was supplied to Stalin within a matter of weeks. Who was it supplied by? Ursula Kosinski. Now, she was operating very close to MI5's station at Blenheim, outside Oxford, at that time. And who was the person in MI5 who had best access to that report? Roger Hollis, in his capacity as MI5's lead man on nuclear security and nuclear affairs, as well as Soviet counter-espionage. Was he the person who supplied Ursula Kosinski with the Quebec Agreement? We don't know. But what I encourage you to look at here, and you have the underpinnings before you in paper, is that if you take this set of considerations as a whole, you have a set of anomalies, a set of events in the years of the Second World War, which again and again point back to Roger Hollis as suspect. And there is no other candidate who fits that pattern and those suspicions in the way that he does. Let us turn finally to 1C. These are things that occurred after 1945. The first is, I've referred to Ursula Kosinski. Her code name for the GRU was Sonia. And throughout the 1940s, right up to the time when she fled Britain in 1950, when the, the British government was starting to close in on her because Klaus Fuchs had been exposed. She was protected by Roger Hollis. Now, there's a very interesting story to this. In her memoirs written from behind the Iron Curtain under the pen name Ruth Werner, she wrote years later that she always felt she had a protective hand inside MI5. Now, whatever one makes of that, whatever she knew and wasn't saying, what we can show is that during those years, the decade from 1940 when Sonia arrived in Britain up to 1950 when she fled, Roger Hollis was in fact personally and directly protecting her from suspicion, from surveillance, from notice, from interrogation. This is not imaginary, this is a matter of record. Uh, so the fact that she would be uh, protected, and that Hollis was was actually doing that protection, uh, is on the face of it, certainly anomalous. And if there's an innocent explanation of it, then somebody needs to provide that. On the face of it, it is certainly strongly consistent with Hollis having been in fact a protective hand, because like Sonia, he was working for the GRU. Secondly, and this is more contentious, but something that needs the closest examination, in 1951, famously, Guy Burgess and Donald McLean, having been exposed as KGB operatives, fled Britain. And this then drew suspicion down on Kim Philby. There has long been a belief that Burgess and McLean were warned by somebody within the British government that they were under suspicion. And one of those suspect uh, suspected of doing it because he would have been in a prime position to have known what was going on was Roger Hollis. He was in fact ideally placed to warn them. Did he do so? Well it's never been satisfactorily explored and it won't do to settle for speculation or surmise. Uh, it needs to be critically examined in this wider context. Finally a number of would-be defectors were betrayed on Hollis's watch 
I refer in the map to Vladimir Skripkin, who, based in Hong Kong, put out feelers to British intelligence people that he would defect. Uh, the fact that he was putting out these feelers was known in MI5 and would have been specifically known to Hollis. And Skripkin was betrayed to Moscow so that when he innocently returned to Moscow believing that he could tidy up his affairs and in effect he was arrested, uh, interrogated and executed. These are the kinds of things which taking place after 1945 suggest that Ellie may well still have been in place. And if you take that total set of considerations into play and we know that Hollis was in place throughout that time in the right positions, in the pole position to have actually done this long series of things, then on the face of it, there seems to be a strong case for suspecting at the very least that he was in fact Ellie.